The year is 2000. The world has not, as many predicted, been crippled by the Y2K bug, but has continued with business as usual, beset by war, poverty, hunger, crime, and drug abuse. And following the critical acclaim of his movies Out of Sight and The Limey, 37-year-old Steven Soderbergh is having the best year of his career. Aaron Brockovich, released in March, has been raking in the cash and is predicted to do well in awards season, but he's about to upstage himself with another film at the end of December, the sprawling war on drugs drama, Traffic. Yeah, well, it's really too bad he didn't win Best Director for Aaron Brockovich. The guy who beat him seems nice, though. I don't know. Does anyone still talk about that guy? Welcome to the Filmographer's Podcast, where we study a director's entire career, one film at a time. I'm Kier Graf. And I'm Michael Morisi. In our first season, we're turning the spotlight on Steven Soderbergh, one of Hollywood's most fascinating and versatile directors. We discuss why each of his films succeeded or failed, always looking at them in the context of the Hollywood landscape at the time they were released. As always, we want to know how working artists make a living doing what they love, because we are working artists who make a living doing what we love. We really hope you'll join us on our journey to watch or rewatch all of Soderbergh's movies. And the Oscar goes to Steven Soderbergh for Traffic. This is the first Academy Award and third nomination for Steven Soderbergh. He is also nominated this evening for Aaron Brockovich. In 1996, Steven Soderbergh was thinking about drugs. Not scoring and using them, but the role they play in people's lives and in our culture and the often arbitrary ways in which our society penalizes the sale and use of drugs. Since his divorce from Betsy Brantley, he had been in an off-and-on relationship with Laura Bickford, an up-and-coming producer. She had visited him in Baton Rouge during the filming of The Underneath, and they lived together for a while in L.A. As you may be able to predict, Soderbergh's intimacy issues would eventually doom the relationship. But I'm getting ahead of myself. While he was in L.A. working on Out of Sight in 1997, Bickford told him she'd been trying to secure the rights for Traffic, with a K, a six-part miniseries that first aired on Britain's Channel 4 in 1989 and appeared in the U.S. on Masterpiece Theatre in 1990. But she didn't have the money to secure the rights. Soderbergh, who said around that time, quote, I had come to the end of anything that I had to say about myself that was compelling, end quote, was infected with her enthusiasm for the project and apparently loaned her the money. While filming Aaron Brockovich, another movie with obvious social significance, he took meetings at all the major studios to pitch a film remake of Traffic. Bickford and Soderbergh also needed a writer. They became interested in Stephen Gagan, based on his script for Havoc, which was about rich American teens who mimic the gangsta lifestyle until an encounter with real gangsters provides a sobering lesson. Havoc would not become a film in its own right until 2005. What they didn't know was that Gagan had already been working on a movie about drugs since 1997 with director Ed Zwick. Gagan had received substantial funding to do research, a fact that blows my mind, and had spoken to politicians and decision makers high up in the war on drugs. Mike, have you ever received funding just to do research? Yeah, well, I seldom get paid for actual produced work, so no. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, me neither, but a girl can dream. Gagan is a fascinating character. He was both an Emmy-winning TV writer for his work on NYPD Blue and addicted to heroin and cocaine. He started using drugs while attending a private school in Louisville, Kentucky, and continued to use drugs through the ups and downs of his career, eventually being arrested roughly two dozen times. By the mid-90s, he was a successful screenwriter despite the fact that he sometimes smoked crack in his offices on the Universal and Fox lots. Woof. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's some real permanent midnight stuff there, isn't it? Yeah, that's, uh, that's something. Sorry. <laughs> Fortunately for Gagan, by July 1997, uh, he had bottomed out and sought treatment shortly after winning his Emmy and around the time he began working on what would become traffic. And what is amazing to me is despite his own experiences, He was pitching his approach 
to the movie as a satire of the war on drugs, akin to Dr. Strangelove. I mean, just the idea, like, I don't know. He's like, he's, maybe it was a defense mechanism. I don't know. I mean, traffic's pretty hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, anyway, that was definitely his intention. Working on it, that was what uh, he and Ed Zwick were like, they were conceiving of the movie. Which is not a, a terrible idea. It's not no, a bad idea. We no. joke. It's not actually a bad idea. And I wonder what that would look like. I don't know. The, the tone of Dr. Strangelove, I think, is damn near impossible to replicate. I mean, black humor seems appropriate for the war on drugs. And the war on drugs is something we I definitely made fun of as as a kid in the 1980s. It's just that... I guess it's mostly dis- given his experiences as an addict right. who's spent time in jail cells. It seems weird that like, oh, ha, ha, ha. You know, this seems like a weird <laughs> note. But anyway, after hearing the despair from the people in the DEA, the Pentagon, and elsewhere who were really sincere about their efforts to stem the flow of drugs into the U.S., Gagan stalled out. He didn't know how to make it funny. Uh, he also didn't know how to cram all of this massive amount of information he'd learned into a single narrative. Yeah, which is, um, you know, it's ironic because if you try to make traffic today, especially since it's already based on a TV series, it would be a series. It would be some sort of mini or who knows, but it would definitely take a longer form. And it goes to show how, how different both the cinematic and television landscapes were at this time. You know, statement movies for adults uh, were still viable box office draws. I mean, hell, Soderbergh made two in one year. <laughs> um, but this was pre-prestige TV, you know, serious television aimed at adults of the non-episodic variety, they just weren't a big thing. You know, bear in mind, Sopranos, you know, which broke the TV mold, that had just appeared a year beforehand. It, it seems older. I, when I recollect about Sopranos and I think about traffic, I, th- I feel like Sopranos feels a lot earlier, but Agreed. it's really, a, they're, they're really close. I mean, they're a year apart. So, we hadn't even, we hadn't even reached the six feet under phase of HBO. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm always so bad with dates and time passing and years and stuff. But yeah, this is the 25th anniversary of the airing of The Sopranos, which HBO is is now pushing. And and interestingly, Mariah and I uh, started watching rewatching The Sopranos again just like last week. Wow, okay. it's, it's very interesting to to see it again now, and honestly, it still holds up. Yeah, I've watched a little here and there. It's still great. Yeah, it's still it's still terrific. So everything about the movie changed when Zwick, who had been planning to direct, basically just called Soderbergh and said, hey, it looks looks like we're both making the same movie. So why don't we work together instead of competing with each other? Soderbergh agreed. I mean, partly because (laughs) he's being given the opportunity to direct and Zwick came on board as a producer. So Soderbergh and Laura Bickford brought new energy and new ideas, which helped because, again, had apparently kind of stalled out. And using the frame of the traffic miniseries was a light bulb moment for Gagan because he had never amazingly considered multiple Mm storylines. He was trying to find the through line for through a single character. And he says that Soderbergh was referencing Robert Altman and calling it the Nashville version of the war on drugs, which it doesn't have the Nashville vibe, but I kind of get it. Yeah, no, I get it. And it's it's funny. I I would love to hear and we go into this a little bit in this podcast. I want to I feel like I'm just like passing the buck, but like I'd love to hear the behind the scenes story of this. I'm like, wait, that's what we do. Uh, <laughs> but like, that's our job. <laughs> damn it. But I would like to hear more about, and this is something I, I don't know you'll ever unearth, like how knowing where Gagan was and knowing how the project really started taking form and shape and and life when Soderbergh came on. I wonder if it's one of those incidents where, you know, uh, this is chronicled well, and I've mentioned this before, the book that I love. um, Oh, what's it called? It's the book about Chinatown and Robert town and all that stuff. Um, um, But anyway, everyone, if you know, you know what I'm talking about, but it was really about how like, Robert Town was writing this massive screenplay about like the why, you know, this crime. It was still a crime noir, but it was about the water usage and all this Californian um, political stuff. And the version, according to this book that was that was made really was, you know, Polanski reshaping the the the, the screenplay 
from town was allegedly like 200 or 300 pages, something <laughs> like that. And it was sprawling and huge. And um, Polanski kind of found it. Um, now, he doesn't get credit. It's funny. It's that's the Chinatown screenplay is, is often cited as being the greatest screen, one of the greatest screenplays ever written. Sure. And Polanski, you know, really, um, apparently, if this book is to be believe, and I have no reason to believe it's uh, Sam Wasson, who's a great film journalist. Uh, there's no reason to believe that it's not true, but Polanski played a huge role in shaping that story. And I just wonder if there's a parallel with Soderbergh in this. Yeah. Well, uh, we've talked recently and, and frequently about Soderbergh's, um, you know, directive to always find simplicity and to find clarity. And, you know, this is, you're turning a, a mini series into a single movie albeit a long movie with many characters, but uh, there's n no question in my mind that, that Soderbergh had to have, have been key to that. Yeah, I agree. And and interesting too that uh, you know, Soderbergh is always referencing these you know 70s film directors who who we we truly love. I think most people wouldn't think of this as being too Altman esque, but again, like you start with your influence and then you put your own stamp on it. Yeah, it's kind of funny now. Like it's. Uh such a sad thing like I, I can imagine talking to you know he he was like on the very probably if i'm doing my math sort of correct uh the the cusp of producers actually knowing what the hell he's talking about now you this young generation if you go in and you're like and i don't know, god i sound so old like the uh, the young kids but yeah. if you go in and be like hey i want to make a movie it's gonna be like robert altman meets hal ashby it'd be like yeah yeah what are those <laughs> well it's like yeah he was pitching out, out of sight as uh, with uh, hal ashby comp and this, well, this one, and, uh, and well, we'll get to it. He's he used some other 70s comps. Soderbergh started talking to Gagan in depth while he was shooting The Limey in 1998. And together they finished the outline before Soderbergh started shooting Aaron Brockovich in mid-1999. I mean, the guy's amazing. He's always working on multiple levels, multiple projects. They were trying to compress this whole miniseries with a new plot line set in Mexico and all of Gagan's research, which is obviously no easy task, Talk about long screenplays. Gagan's first draft of the completed screenplay was 165 pages long. So, Mike, for people who haven't written and produced a screenplay, just how long is that? Uh, well, the general rule um, is that one page of script is typically, uh, typically, I use very particular that word, typically is one minute of screen time. So, you know, like I said, it, it varies. But like if you have a 165 page script, you're looking at what nearly nearly a three hour movie. Well, the Steves hold up in hotels a couple of times to do drugs. I mean, work on the script. <laughs> and their work wasn't in vain. They were able to make the shooting script two whole pages shorter. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to skip most of the gory details of financing and securing a distributor. But let's just say it was a challenge. Uh, so again, talking about 70s comps, there hadn't been a successful movie about drugs since The French Connection in 1971. And studios were hesitant to finance a long, depressing film about drug policy in which a large part of the dialogue would be spoken in Spanish. And they would only do it if Soderbergh and company could secure a bankable star. Yes, indeed. And that star was almost Harrison Ford. Indiana Jones. <laughs> We need a little whip, yeah. whip yeah. crack right there. <laughs> yeah, it's a different war on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Ford was apparently, he he was looking to do, from what we've read, I think we've both read this and, and, and discovered this, uh, a movie uh, that with a young and edgy director, and he wanted to kind of... Um, you know, spread his spread his wings, flex his muscles, whatever you want to say, uh, and do something a little bit different. I mean, he was at the time doing, you know, the Patriot Games and the Air Force Ones and stuff like this. It was he was the the get off my plane. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's the dad star. You know, he's the dad movie star at this point, and he, I think he wanted to do something different. And he ended up changing his mind. He backed out, um, and he went on to make What Lies Beneath with Michelle Pfeiffer, uh, directed by. Robert Zemeckis, so very safe stuff. We, although it's a movie I like, but um, sure, you know, you know, it's a, it's a pretty safe movie. And he plays the villain. You know, sorry, spoilers. I mean, it's twenty three years ago, but he plays the villain. Uh, so I guess that's something. But he just never, never did come around to making that movie with a director like Soderbergh. For one glorious month in his career, he was ready to to tear up the rule book and and try something new. Yeah, so I guess he came in in like January and. Suddenly, everything was exploding. Laura Bickford is this, you know, green film producer. 
who's like trying to get him to do it for two million and his agent is like (laughs) (laughs) he's like like don't worry like because bickford didn't yet know at that point that if you get an a-lister you get more money to make the movie and it works itself out you know like they'll make it for half their fee and they'll get the other half on the back end and yada yada but it just suddenly changed everything threw it up in the air fox pictures which had kind of lost interest was suddenly interested in it again and Soderbergh didn't want to make it with them and then he dropped out and then everything kind of went back to the way it was well correct me if i'm wrong too didn't fox have a so it was originally set up at fox yeah and then they gave Soderbergh and bickford and company uh um permission to basically shop it and try to do it elsewhere because they weren't getting any traction with it yeah but they had a stipulation and this is crazy but it was specifically if you get Harrison Ford, <laughs> you must come back yeah, and do yeah, it at Fox. Yeah, yeah. And for a moment, they had Harrison Ford. And they, they thought there's no way Harrison Ford's coming in. And then out of the blue, Harrison Ford calls. Right. <laughs> and it was before even like he was even shown it or any interest. It was just like they threw a dart at Fox, threw a dart. <laughs> and they're like, uh, it landed on Harrison Ford. If you get Harrison Ford, you got, we got yeah, to do yeah, it, you know? Yeah. Uh, but then it went back and uh, dissolved again at Fox. Yeah. Hilariously. Well, all this was going on, uh, Soderbergh was financing pre-production with his own money to the tune of like $200,000, apparently. Yeah, goodbye, Brockovich money. Um, hope, you didn't, hope you didn't need it. <laughs> and then finally, USA Films, uh, who had been interested since the beginning, to their credit, became the distributor of record. And that's who Soderbergh wanted to work with anyway. And yeah. so they went ended up uh, being a Pretty well financed, ultimately independent film with this secure distribution and moved forward from there. Yeah. So traffic with the 163 page script, 135 speaking parts and locations in seven cities began filming on April 8th, 2000 and shot for 54 days. Production wrapped in June. The film was locked in October and released on December 27th, just in time for awards consideration. I mean, listeners, I hope you understand not only how batshit crazy Soderbergh's pace is, but how even batshit crazier it is that he's done it a couple times in a row. (laughs) (laughs) Like, you know, with the limey, we're counting that, which is only, what, two years ago? You know, that (laughs) that, yeah, it was. So that makes two movies in two years that have had a pre-production to release schedule of nine months or less. Now, we can sit here, here, you and I can sit here and joke about how it takes some directors that amount of time to shoot a single scene. And we've named these glacial friends of ours a few times and just <laughs> having fun. Name it, um, James. <laughs> but it's more important to understand just how wildly Soderbergh outpaces even normal directors <laughs> like Sure, maybe a director can make a movie in this kind of compressed timeline like once in a while, but doing it twice in two years and making another movie in between is insanity. I mean, the mind boggles. Yeah, it's uh, let me I'll I'll give you this, you know, for for context. We wrote uh, we being Tim Seeley and I, my my co-writer, uh, and, and we filmed, you know, we shot and went through post-production on my first film, Revealer. We did that. And then we went to release, actually, in about a year. OK, so and that's on a sh- smaller scale, but that's fast. That's really fast. So writing, shooting, post release a year is, is very quick now. We had less money and we had less manpower than Soderbergh does. He has more resources. He has more available around him. But still, it's it's similar enough. And by the end of that, you know, marathon in which we were sprinting, <laughs> we, everyone was cooked. We were all exhausted because it's so much. It's so much work and it's so intense um, because it means so much to you and there's so much at stake. We were exhausted. Now, would we have made another movie right away in the way that Soderbergh did? Absolutely. Like you never say no to the to the job and Soderbergh's the same way. And this is why he does it. But it would have been hard. It would have been really, really hard to do it again. And it's just par for the course for our man Soderbergh. Hi, it's Sarah, Hallie, and John from Forgotten Film Club, a podcast that reimagines the movies that time forgot for a modern audience. 
Our format is loose, conversational, and we end each episode with a fun, modern recasting. We discuss movies from the 80s, 90s, and aughts that weren't critically acclaimed when they were released, but have good bones. If you like horror, check out our episodes on The Gift or What Lies Beneath. If comedy is more your thing, try our episodes on Dick or Jumpin' Jack Flash. And this summer, we're covering the queer comedy Broken Hearts Club, Molly Ringwald's teen pregnancy drama For Keeps, and the 90s rom-com One Fine Day starring George Clooney and Michelle Pfeiffer. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts or visit us on Instagram at Forgotten Film Club. Bye. 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 Mike, may I have your one-sentence summary of traffic? <clears throat> A kaleidoscopic probing look on the war on drugs told from multiple perspectives and across different countries showing just how devastating, hypocritical, and doomed this battle actually is. And if the drug czar's own daughter can become a crack whore, is any of us safe? <laughs> uh, okay, Mike, I'm going to ask you to do something that is not easy. Tell me what you think about traffic as a movie, but leave the drugs out of it. Is it even possible to talk about traffic without talking about drugs? I mean, I don't know if you can. It's really hard. Like, I, I, I've gone over this a lot. I'm like, can you talk about Goodfellas but leaving out the crime? You know, like, it's <laughs> <laughs> like part of me wants to say, and that's the problem the movie has. We don't know anyone beyond their relationship to narcotics, meaning anyone being any of the characters beyond right. their relationship to drugs. But what do we know about Henry Hill? Speaking of Goodfellas, you know, do we even care about him at all, any of his life, if he didn't want to be a gangster? You know, and I don't I don't know the answer to that. I mean, we can talk about the movie from a technical standpoint and, and why not? Soderbergh did win an Oscar. <laughs> so, <laughs> Stealing it from Soderbergh. <laughs> yeah. Robbed. And for that, the movie is obviously tremendous. Like we're going to talk about a lot about his handheld and all that stuff. I mean, I can talk about it a bit, but we've alluded to it in previous episodes already. Like he's going handheld here. He's handling the camera himself. Um, the the use like he did in Out of Sight and uh, uh, the underneath. He's doing a lot with color to tell you we're here. We're here. We're here. You know, locations, uh, not really time this 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 one right, around, right. but just locations with, again, a, a narrative fractured by uh, 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 location instead of uh, time, but still fractured nonetheless. So he's doing a lot and he's giving it that clarity that he always requires. So from a technical standpoint, juggling all these these storylines, juggling all these characters, getting it totally even is tremendous it is a tremendous achievement and there's while i you know maybe prefer a different movie from that year uh, <laughs> you know i still look at traffic and be like yeah that's this is a this is a great remarkable achievement but the story it's hard to talk about it you know it's like in 2000 the movie is i was trying to go through my mind i remember seeing this actually with with my then girlfriend now wife it was eye-opening i remember seeing it in the theater and thinking like i'll never do drugs again and i don't even do drugs <laughs> but flash forward all these years later and it feels i don't know kind of quaint kind of dated you know and look you can't blame soderbergh or anyone involved for that like you make a capital s statement movie and the risk you take is that that statement might not age well. And I'm not saying the movie has aged poorly because it hasn't. It's still compelling and a marvelous technical achievement. And the ambition is astonishing. But I'll say this. We live in a world now where marijuana has been legalized. And at the time this movie was made, like that was inconceivable, you know? So it's it's tough to it gives you a lot of complexities in terms of context to unpack but i, I want to hear what you think though like what do you what did you make of it yeah it's you make excellent points throughout i mean the i do think it's really very difficult to talk about this film without drugs and the landscape of the time and we'll definitely get into that in a little more detail as we go on um and and your point about like knowing the characters outside of their relationship to the the central theme of drugs is a really interesting one and i think you know probably you know th every movie has you know whether it's rocky and it's about a boxer and like you mostly know him through you know 
the, the ring, except that, but you also do learn about him, I guess, outside of that. But the, the biggest difference in traffic is that it's such a huge ensemble. I just don't think you have time to get to know anybody else outside of it. That's a great point. That's very fair. You know, so I remember this as a movie that at the time I liked okay, but wasn't, uh, wasn't really that into. Um, but rewatching it multiple times to prepare for recording this episode, uh, it's grown on me a little bit each time. I think partly that's just because of the accomplishment of what he was able to pull off just filmically, whatever. But um, I think, too, that the, you know, the, the performances are so good throughout. The tone is so consistent despite the huge sprawling scope of it. And also the, the relationships of the characters within each particular little world of, of the film feel pretty true. I mean, a little bit l less in some cases, like, uh, uh, like the, I always forget the character names, right. But like the Cheadle and Guzman characters, like the two, the two DEA guys who spent a lot of time in a van, like that alone feels like it could be a movie. Like they could carry a movie because they have such a great little, um, relationship and so much back and forth. And, um, it, it's the more times I watch it kind of the more alive it feels, which, which is, interesting even though i i think in an overall sense the film is a little dated um and and some of the stuff that doesn't date as well is actually some of the stuff that is kind of the most mainstream and it was interesting so last night i was watching the third second or third director's commentary track i don't know there's so many people you have to tell your friends about this podcast if nothing else and reward Kier's diligence because this is not a short movie <laughs> <laughs> this is not this is not a short movie yeah it's, sometimes just the, the sheer amount of time it takes to just really properly prepare for these is, is fascinating because you just you can't watch a movie on fast forward and, and get anything uh, out of it but so last night i was watching uh, watching and listening to the commentary track that has the three producers and a reporter who um contributed a lot of you know research and then also a guy who was actually pretty high up in the DEA. And I mean, these guys talk about doing your homework. I mean, the filmmakers did their homework. They talked to so many real players and a lot of these real players actually end up on screen in, the, in this film. But the thing that struck out to me last night was the guys who had some real experience of this, like the DEA guy and the reporter and some of the, like the people who kind of have this they know what's real and what's not. And they were kind of critical of some of the scenes that in the film that feel most like a crime film, like the, the assassination scene in a parking lot outside the courthouse. And they're oh, like, yeah. well, this wouldn't happen for this and this reason. And nobody notices the gun barrel sticking out the window. And there were a couple of things that were just kind of cop procedural stuff that they were calling out. And I thought, yeah, whatever. I mean, Soderbergh has reasons for everything he does. Sometimes it's just budgetary pressures. Sometimes it's just storytelling efficiency. Sometimes in a movie, you just have to have somebody screw up because if things don't go wrong, you don't have a movie. Right. So I think there were legitimate reasons for all of those things, but bringing this way, way around in a, in a huge circle, like those were the things that didn't age well to me because they felt more like something you would see in a regular cop drama, like the scene where they're sequestering Miguel Ferrer. Um, yeah. who's like one of my favorite character actors. He's so good. Oh, he's great. Albert in Twin Peaks is his shining moment. So Miguel Ferrer, he's great in this movie, but the scenes where they're kind of sequestering him in a hotel room prior to his testimony weren't actually the best because they just kind of felt like stuff we, we had seen before, but there's so much about this movie that really does feel like stuff that we hadn't seen before this moment. And so I do think that it, it ultimately succeeds pretty well on its own terms but yeah drugs are woven tightly into the fabric yeah for sure yeah and i think those are all great points and i think that like it's hard in the context because like you see all these things like you see things we've seen before you know and it's it, you lose you lose you risk losing uh seeing the forest for the trees so to speak mm -hmm. because yeah the stuff we're Cheadle and Guzman are together and they're in the van are really good. And then, yeah, the sequestered, then they just turn into like hard ass cops, you know, yeah. and that's kind of it, you know? So you, you, there are some things you're like, yeah, 
do we need it? How yeah. much? How much of it? Um, and it it would take probably a lot of viewings to unpack that because it's so dense. And there are some things in this movie, I will say, as a criticism, there are some things in this film that are a little hard to track on first viewing. Um, you know, who is this guy? What's it, Why is he doing that? You know, there's just a few little, not many. And I think Soderbergh does a really admirable job of keeping it clear for us. But it's really hard. And it's almost like he could have probably kept it more clear if he would have added more minutes. But he also, he's always trying to make it shorter. And yeah. he just knew he couldn't have a three-hour runtime. The first cut they screened was three hours. And it's just too long. Yeah, it's just, it's, um, it's a hard movie to make successful. You know, uh, we've talked before, like the box office numbers. Um, but a three-hour movie, even a two-and-a-half-hour movie, whatever it is. Okay, well that limits how many times you can show it in a day, Yep. you know, and if you can show it five times, six times instead of five, you're going to want to show it. You want another bite of the apple. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, this movie was an unlikely commercial success. And we'll definitely get into that. And uh, shortly, I mean, just still talking about the film as film, uh, you know, I think this is showing the, the fruits of, uh, you know, out of sight, you know, where Soderbergh really learns how to assemble the right cast mm -hmm. and let them do what they do. And, and obviously he's also like, like many of our favorite directors, he's come to have many of his favorite actors. And so he's kind of like getting the old crew back together for another heist. If I may <laughs> wait a second, <laughs> uh, but you know, he's, he's got a lot of his stable of regulars. I mean, Albert Finney with a great small, I mean, it's just, it's a little more than a cameo, but it's, he's got two scenes. Apparently, Soderbergh didn't even know he was going to be in it. The producer and the casting director kind of pulled the wool over his eyes. They didn't use Finney's name on the casting sheet. And when uh, Soderbergh showed up to film the scene, it was Albert Finney in like costume and makeup. And he was like, oh, my God. Aww. So how cool is that? That is really cool. But I also love that like th there was some rando who was like cast and so everything like, yeah whatever let's go <laughs> <laughs> right right yeah he's because it's a huge huge cast and he was like oh you know we've we got so and so on the call sheet great he'll be he'll be there yeah <laughs> and so then obviously he's got Cheadle and guzman like guys he loves and has used and will use again um viola davis again like small role but he's you know he's given her another another chance and obviously she's grown into her own career but like he's he's a guy who gave her some early opportunities yeah it's very cool you know, and I, I don't want to do a deep dive on the on the casting just because with a, a film this size, again, we could go on. We're naming all 135. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he he's learned and this is what's going to make him a great candidate when we get to Ocean's Eleven and all these other things like Soderbergh now knows how to assemble a great cast, let them shine. They love working with him. He doesn't over direct. He's a, an actor's director for sure. and. You can't make a big ensemble movie like this if you don't have that talent. No, no question. No, no, absolutely. You know, there's a, there's a true mark of a of a director. You know that like um, who work with the same people because you have some directors who don't. <laughs> you know, um, and there's something to be said about you know a director who brings back the same crew, the same cast. Uh, it's a credit to them and how much they enjoy you know collaborating. For sure. Visually, this film is really interesting, I think, because it's got some, you mentioned the, the extreme use of, of color, and maybe this is like one of the best examples of that new trademark, because he goes all in. Oh, yeah. You know, like the first courtroom scene when it's blue, and you're like, what is going on? It's so blue. He's using weird film stocks. He's, it was, the whole thing was shot with available light, mm -hmm. which is why sometimes actors are standing like literally over lamps to try to get their <laughs> face lit well enough. Um, he's doing, a, uh, as he started doing with like the limey, he's like flashing the film stock and he's doing some weird tricks like that. Yeah. Risky. <laughs> yeah. It's risky. You can actually ruin film. And you know, it's you know, some people who just like a beautiful, you know, picture perfect movie, uh, like he had with King of the Hill may be turned off by this, but it's clearly something he loves. It's, it's honestly not my favorite thing in general in film. And, you know, as you said, he's gone entirely to handheld here and, I'm not a big handheld guy. I love a, f a camera on a tripod. I love a smooth dolly shot. I love, you know, I love really elegant camera work in general. But I, I make this exception for Soderbergh because I feel like he employs it so well. Mm -hmm. And certainly in this film, which is where he's, he was referencing, you know, not just like the French Connection, but films like Z and, the, and Battle of Algiers. 
And he was talking about a quasi documentary style. And I would say that it really suits the subject here. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think that like I I'm with you. Um, I think uh, handheld can be not just overused, but misused. Yes. Um, and I get the practicality of it because it, you, you can go faster. You know, you're just like, you don't have to meticulously. I mean, you still have to set up your shots. Don't get me wrong. But like you do, and especially if you're using available light, you it is giving you the freedom to one, be more creative uh, on the spot um, and also giving you the freedom to just go faster, maybe get get a few more takes in the time that you have. So there are a lot of, uh, from a filmmaking practical standpoint, there are a lot of benefits to it. But at the same time, like you can abuse like the handheld and it just makes it look bad you know, it makes it look shoddy. And I don't, I'm not, I'm not a fan of that, but I am a fan of like using it smartly and appropriately. And traffic is one of them. You can see, yes, that the idea of the documentary feel is very clear and very appropriate. So get in and the handheld still is pretty stable. Like I, it's not like you see, you see, I am sure everyone knows you've seen the handheld movies where yeah. they're, they're just, that thing's bouncing all over the place and it just never really sets where traffic it sets you know more or less it still has a little tilt and you know uh to it but like not a ton yeah i would agree and it was certainly like essential for his this lean and mean production style that he wanted to incorporate mm -hmm. now apparently he originally talked about um using a video camera because he wanted to go so lean and so fast until the producer said look you got michael douglas you can't shoot michael douglas with the video camera, you have to <laughs> you have to put film in it. He needs something a little bigger to look at, so he knows he's in a movie, which is pretty hilarious. Yeah, it's so weird. It's such a. I mean, I'm sure now Michael Douglas has gotten over that, you know, because we're so far away from that. I mean, now it's like film is rarely used, you know, uh, and it's a special occasion almost. Yeah, the hell, you know, <laughs> a few years from now, now being the time of traffic, I mean, Soderbergh's going to be pointing iPhones at people. And, and also on the one of my favorite stories about the uh, the speed of the thing. Uh, Lord, so Bickford tells a story about shooting Benicio del Toro in the famous pool scene, which was del Toro's oh, idea. Yeah. So uh, for those of you who don't know, del Toro plays a Mexican cop who's going to talk to DEA agents, but he wants to make sure nobody's recording anything. And so he insists that they talk in the swimming pool of a hotel. And it was just kind of an improv thing that Soderbergh went with. The DEA agents felt like that, you know, who were consulting on the film thought that was a little bit lame, but it's a, it's a great image in the film and it gets the point across. So they shoot that scene. They're actually staying at the hotel because they were using actual locations for everything. Uh, Del Toro goes back to his room to dry off and you know, it's like a 10 or 15 minute walk back from the pool to his room. He, or no, his trailer, I guess. Sorry. I think he's staying at a trailer. And um, so he's, he's toweling off. There's a knock on his door. Uh, saying they're ready to shoot his next scene, which is in a hotel room at the same hotel. And it's a totally different scene, but they're just trying to make maximum use of, of the location. And he's just like flabbergasted. Like, I haven't even toweled off yet and you're ready to shoot me again. But Soderbergh, I mean, he could just pick up the camera. He he was wearing a wetsuit in the pool, gets out, takes off the wetsuit. He towels off. He goes to the hotel room. He's like, let's let's shoot the next scene. And that's how they were able to shoot such an amazingly involved movie for honestly as cheap as they did it's not a cheap film but some directors would have needed a hundred million for it yeah it could have been a lot longer and for you know it's funny but i don't think people realize and forgive me if they do i'm sure there's some who do know this but like when you hear about a movie going into reshoots for example it's so costly because the thing is is that like every day you know people are making salary on sets you know i mean the the, the above the line are but like everybody who's in the the crew and sometimes even the cast they're making day rates, you know, so they're getting paid by the day. And if you go into overtime, you're getting your time and a half and double time, whatever, because it's union stuff. So like going in and, you know, needing extra days means needing a lot more money. So like him being able to cut down those days is something that really is able to help him cut down that budget as well. And that's so important, you know, like and and the fact is, like, also, that's the available light thing. You know, I've. Like I've worked now on, you know, my own movies, two of my own movies. I was a PA way back in the day. And I know 
uh, for, from this direct experience, like it just takes a long time. When you're filming a movie that what I would call the traditional way, let's, let's just say setting up a shot, setting up the lighting, getting everything, you know, oh, the color is a little off here. We got to, you know, we got to filter in this or whatever. Like that's your day. That's going to take up, I don't know, 60% of your day is just waiting for things to get set up. If you eliminate that and you're like, hey, we're just going to use natural light and the light is right and we're going to have a handheld camera, like that's, you can at least double your day, you know, by the math, you know, which is yeah. tremendous. And Soderbergh has said that he has done reshoots on almost every movie he's made, but being him, his reshoots often involve him like getting one actor to come meet him at like his house and they paint a wall or something or and they shoot an insert or or something. They they tend to be really cheap gorilla kind of inserts. Like at the uh, they did a they did a little reshoot or an add-on or something at the end of traffic, which is the scene of Michael Douglas walking out of the White House and they stole that shot. Like they didn't have permission or permit or anything. They got somebody they knew who worked in the White House press court to invite Michael Douglas in for a tour. And then Soderbergh's just out on the sidewalk with the camera oh <laughs> filming Michael Douglas as he walks out. Like, so they basically had like Bickford, you know, like, I don't know, they probably had a couple of other people around to help, but they just had a few people and they just stole the shot. So it wasn't like this big budget reshoot. Like that's the kind of reshooting Soderbergh does when he needs it. It's just like a, a little thing fascinating i didn't know that it's a great story and he's probably like five days uh, like uh on, you know he's finished five days early anyway yeah so. <laughs> very much all right so now let's talk about drugs yeah <laughs> i don't actually like really like drugs i don't know why i said that <laughs> <laughs> is there anyone out there who still isn't clear about what doing drugs does okay last time this is your brain. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? Mike, I'm a little bit older than you. I'm guessing you didn't wear an anti Reagan t shirt in high school like I did. What do you remember about the war on drugs? <laughs> You're right. I, um, I don't have any anti-Reagan shirts, <laughs> uh, but I do remember Dare mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, just say no. But really, that's that's actually about it. I mean, I, I remember there being a war on drugs. I mean, you know, obviously I know about it now, but I remember it when I was a kid. But at that time, I didn't really know um, much about what that meant. Yeah, I mean... It's funny because, uh, you know, I didn't grow up in a drug culture. I grew up in a beer culture. I grew up in Montana. So <laughs> beer was the drug of choice. Although there were some, there were definitely some kids, uh, you know, with some bad skunk weed, like, you know, let's go up on the mountain and get high. Do you feel anything? <laughs> I think I do. Oh man, we're so, we're so high. I feel really high. It just kicked in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There were, I definitely had a few formative experiences like that. And then later during my musical career, some actual drug experiences. But I do remember this, this, this culture of it. And mostly what I remember was this feeling of, of being scolded, right? You know, like it, 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 it's interesting because the filmmakers of Traffic, I mean, they were so thoughtful about how this would be received and how they wanted to portray these things and stories. It wasn't going to be this big moral lesson. They wanted to show, I mean, Soderbergh's clearly not like a big drug booster, but they also wanted to be very nuanced in, in their message here. Now, earlier we were talking about how this film does seem to be somewhat dated in 2024. And being so topical, it really can't help it. And the landscape has changed radically since 2000. You know, none of us could have imagined being able to walk into a store in Chicago and buy a joint or gummies or loose weed in back then. I just couldn't even imagine it. No, I mean, it's, it's I, until obviously till recently, I never thought I'd see the day uh, where marijuana became legalized. Um, I really didn't. And, you know, here we are. And especially like the year 2000, you know, like get buying weed from drug dealers was still, that's how you got weed, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So like, it's so weird to, to think about this. So yeah, I mean, we're, we're in such a, like everything else, we live in a world where everything I feel like is uh, moving so quickly, you know, because of technology and the internet and things like that. But like, it's a remarkable 
a remarkable amount of time. I mean, it's 20 years is, is, is a long time. And it's also not to think that like we went from like inconceivable to actually a past law. Yeah. And some parts of the country where they're experimenting with decriminalizing harder drugs. I mean, look at Portland, um, although they're starting to roll that back because it didn't work out so well for them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we Some lines. Got to keep some lines. <laughs> some lines are harder to cross. But so a little bit about the war on drugs timeline, just for listeners of all ages who maybe need a little refresher. Uh, I, I thought it was really interesting for myself to kind of go back and look at a few key dates. In 1971, Richard Nixon declared an unofficial war on drugs, but maybe one of the earlier times that that phrase had been used. Uh, and he identified drugs, uh, drug use as public enemy number one. And my conjecture, because I was extremely small at that time, is that maybe, you know, he's also trying to distract people from the failing war in Vietnam. But anyway, the, the phrase war on drugs enters popular culture in a probably the most significant way. Yeah, interesting. And he also famously um, gave, deputized a, a famous drug user, Elvis Presley, in, in the White House, <laughs> who was high at the time. Um, in 1973, uh, the Drug Enforcement Agency was founded. So it didn't exist until 1973. 1976, uh, President Carter, well, well, almost President Carter, Jimmy Carter campaigned on a, um, a platform of decriminalization of pot. Obviously, that wasn't his main platform, but his platform included the idea of decriminalization. Yeah, it's ahead of his time. He was trying to get the hippies to vote for him. 1979 through 1983. So that was the kind of like heyday of like drug flights from Colum Colombia, the cartels uh, through the Bahamas to the U.S. It's a fairly famous time. People think of these little planes landing in Florida and like these kind of outlaw guys in Hawaiian shirts. There's a lot of money and a lot of drugs uh, flowing from Colombia almost directly to the U.S. Um, that would, once the, uh, the authorities kind of caught on, those sh shipments would shift to Mexico, which is kind of where we are when, uh, when traffic is set. In the 1980s were the rise of the Medellin cartel. Um, 1984, Nancy Reagan brought us just say no, which is a helpful way to get people to stop using drugs. So easy. Just that's so simple. Yeah, just one word. Ronald Reagan made it official by signing the Anti-Drug Abuse Act and funded the drug war with $1.7 billion in 1986. Uh, in 1989, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush appointed William Bennett as the first drug czar. At, in the same year, Forbes listed Pablo Escobar as the seventh richest man in the world. Isn't that amazing that they listed him on their, whatever, the 500 or whatever? How, how, how do they know? How do they know? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Because <laughs> one, one of the things I learned is that they, at some point, they, um, the cartels were making so much money that they couldn't count it anymore. And they were really struggling to like even deal with the amount of cash they were bringing, they were taking back home. So they would fill a garbage bag with 20s and like weigh it a few times and then like plus or minus 7%. And they were like, okay, well, we got roughly a million dollars here or whatever it was. That's how much money they were making. So yeah, pure speculation. I think that it seems like the, the pre-internet version of clickbait, maybe. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what it is. It's like, who, I feel bad for number 10, you know, or the eighth, <laughs> eighth richest person who's like, yeah. Oh. yeah, he's like, I know exactly how much money I have. Wait a minute. <laughs> and in 1993, uh, NAFTA took effect. And that, of course, made it much harder to stop drugs flowing across the U.S.-Mexico border because it encouraged trade and allowed uh, trucks to go back and forth more easily. You know, drug cartels would mule drugs back and forth, often just by getting some poor desperate person. $500 goes a long way. You pay somebody um, the money and just for you, it's a crapshoot. Maybe they get caught, maybe they don't. But moving drugs was actually pretty easy for them at that point. And then uh, in 2000, the end of my timeline here, and that's the year traffic came out, Clinton gave $1.3 billion to Colombia to spray herbicides on coca crops. So year 2000, traffic comes out. Obviously, we're in a very different place than we are today in 2024. Now, Mike, I'm appointing you the drug czar of the Filmographer's podcast. Oh, no. <laughs> I hope you use your powers for good. We'll now, see. I have, 
Now, I have three questions for you. One, do you think Traffic is a successful movie about drugs? Yeah, I would say so. I would agree with that. Do you? Yeah, I think so, too. It's it's interesting because, again, we we live in a world where, you know, decriminalization wasn't a huge topic at that time and became one later obviously for you know for good for good reason you know there's a lot of a lot of people on minor you know pot offenses did ridiculous amounts of jail time you know the 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 conversation really changed we're in such a different place but i still feel like it doesn't come across as a movie that's like scolding or hysterical about drugs um there you know some people's mileage will vary on individual scenes or plot lines i do feel that ultimately the the line that sums it up in the movie is uh, at the end when they were wrestling with how to write and how to deliver Michael Douglas's big speech, and it ended up being a last minute decision. He's uh, he's at the White House. He's he's gone through this transformation. It's the the end of his story, his experience of dealing with his drug, his daughter's drug addiction, and he starts to kind of give this boilerplate speech that he's supposed to give, and then he he says something along the lines of, "Well, if there's a war on drugs, then we're also w- waging war on." some of our family members, and I don't know how we wage war on our own family. And that's not an exact quote, but words to that effect. And I think that that's the takeaway from this film. And I think that that's still very timely and relevant. I agree. I think that's a great point. I really think it's a great point that like, he did bring that nuance to it. We're like, um, you know, thinking about a similar a movie around the similar time, like Requiem for a Dream. Mm. Another drug movie, yeah, uh, which is horrifying. Uh, that's a movie. It's like when that's a feel good movie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> can't wait to show my kids. Uh, but like, it didn't really add the nuance in the ending. It just like it was like a relentless, and that was, it was supposed to be like this relentless, yes. harrowing journey into like the depths of being a drug addict. Um, you know, traffic touches on that a little bit with the daughter character, but like it never really brings this nuance to the broader picture, which traffic does nail that landing pretty well. Agreed. Okay, question number two: Do you think traffic is successful without drugs? That is, are the storylines strong enough to make us care about the characters, even if we don't care about drug policy? So I would say no, but like I was saying earlier, I don't necessarily think it needs to be. To be fair, I I watch more of Del Toro's character as a cop in Tijuana. Um, He doesn't have to be drug, you know, busting drug kingpins or anything like that. But, you know, I'd watch another movie with him as a character. You know, one of my favorite uh, and I'm just thinking about this now. One of the best scenes, maybe my favorite scene in the movie, is where he carries the water to his partner's uh, widow. Yeah. It's a really great scene. Like that's a really just a solid character moment that the, the movie delivers really well. Del Toro, I would say, is probably the most fleshed out of all the leads. At least to me, he was the most compelling. So yeah, what do you think? No, I agree completely with what you say. And the Del Toro character is fascinating because in the original script he was actually more of a venal guy yes and 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 del toro worked a lot on the character and and soderbergh and gagan were open to it and he becomes and i think it's important because particularly at that time i mean then and now there's a lot of really shitty sentiment about our neighbors to the south there are a lot of people in this country who have a lot of bias uh against you know Mexicans both living there and immigrating to this country. And I, th- I think it would have been really sad had that character ended up just being a bad guy. And maybe it's a little more of a Hollywood thing, but I think he becomes so nuanced. He's a guy who's doing the best that he can in a horrific circumstance. It's basically a world in which you try to do the right thing, you're probably going to get killed. Yeah. And so he starts out as a guy who's kind of trying to climb the ladder the only way he knows how, has a change of heart, does something really dangerous. Yeah, I, I think Del Toro's care, and you know, I'll watch Del Toro do anything. I mean, good lord, the guy's magnetic. Yes, uh, he's definitely. just fascinating. He makes interesting acting choices. He is, uh, you can't take your eyes off him, and he is, he's really the heart of this movie. Like that character and that performance, one hundred percent. I would have watched a movie just about him. But I agree with you. It's not successful without drugs, but it doesn't have to be. That was their goal. It made yeah, a movie about it, drugs. It's a movie about drugs, right. Third and final question. Would you recommend traffic to audiences today? 
Or do you think people were just so hopped up on the war on drugs that they were getting high on their own supply? <laughs> um, I definitely would recommend it. I mean, look, Traffic ended up losing Best Picture to the broiest of bro movies, Gladiator. <laughs> and you can listen to our thoughts on that in our Aaron Brockovich episode. But if Gladiator can get a sequel a quarter century later, which is happening this year, traffic can still be viewed today. You know, it still makes a salient point. Drugs are bad. They're gross. <laughs> and the damage they do, you know, transcends well beyond the people who use them. There's a scene where the character uh, General Salazar uh, explained to Michael Douglas's character how uh, he has no treatment programs. He almost kind of laughs at the idea uh, in his his take is that, uh, in short, junkies treat themselves by dying. That in and of itself is tragic, but the effects of drug use, I mean, traffic, like the deaths of the junkies is, is obviously tragic and terrible, but the effects of drug use are far more, far more devastating and far reaching than that as traffic shows. And while it's policies, the movie's policies may be out of date because time has changed, uh, it still does a solid job of exploring that the personal, uh, the personal and a little bit broader effects of what what drugs do. I want to thank anyone who spends part of their day creating. I don't care if it's a book, a film, a painting, a dance, a piece of theater, a piece of music. Anybody, anybody who spends part of their day sharing their experience with us. I think this world would be unlivable without art, and I thank you. That includes the Academy, that includes my fellow nominees here tonight. Thank you for inspiring me. Thank you for this. Soderbergh has made movies critics disliked and movies that divided them. This is not one of them. <laughs> Uh, Ebert, who gave it four stars, said, quote, this movie is powerful precisely because it doesn't preach. It is so restrained that at one moment, the judge's final speech, I wanted one more sentence making a point, but the movie lets us supply that thought for ourselves, end quote. And the Oscar for the most overwritten review goes to Stephen Holden of the New York Times, quote, Steven Soderbergh's great despairing squall of a film, Traffic, may be the first Hollywood movie since Robert Altman's Nashville to infuse epic cinematic form with jittery new rhythms and a fresh acid-washed palette. Where Mr. Altman's masterpiece portrayed American culture as a jostling, twangy carnival of honky-tonk dreams, Traffic is a sprawling, multicultural jazz symphony of clashing voices, sounding variations of the same nagging discontent. The performances, in English and Spanish, by an ensemble from which not a false note issues have the clarity and force of pithy instrumental solos insistently piercing through a dense cacophony. <laughs> wow, swowza. Oh, I'm out of breath. <laughs> I mean, he's not wrong, but, you know, cut. he could have said a little more simply, I'd say. Yeah, maybe. Maybe just a, a few less words. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and the New Yorker, David Denby, called it the most exciting and complexly imagined American movie of the year. In The Observer, Andrew Saris said, the promise of sex, lies, and videotape has been fulfilled. Interesting. Uh, Peter Travers, <laughs> Rolling Stone, he's not really a serious film critic in my opinion, but he, he called it a real cannonball, a hard-ass drama about the drug tree that Steven Soderbergh directs like a thriller. It comes out blazing. He's such a goof, man. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I don't think he quite captures it, but he liked it. And I can't overlook our favorite curmudgeon, Jonathan Rosenbaum of the Chicago Reader, who wrote, quote, I don't see this slightly better than average drug thriller with slightly better than average direction by Steven Soderbergh as anything more than a routine rubber stamping of genre reflexes. <sighs> I just... I just, I, you know, as a, as a Chicagoan, I thank God we have other critics. <laughs> we have a great critical infrastructure in Chicago so we can overlook the uh, foibles of one Jonathan Rosenbaum and his 
God, his, uh, I'm just going to say it, the elitism that just exudes out of everything he writes. The, the guy's smart. Yeah, no oh, question. But uh, yeah, we're just, I'm in a, I'm in a culturally very different place from him. And, and just, to, to, I feel like calling it a better than average, slightly better than average drug thriller. I mean, just a drug thriller. Anybody who watched Traffic and came away with the opinion that it's a drug thriller, I think just missed the whole point. No, I mean, and that's the thing. I hate, I hate when cr critics say stuff like that. It's like, oh, we've seen something like this before. And I'm like, wh where? When? What? <laughs> <laughs> Nate, give me, give me the thing that you've seen before that this is. The slightly than average drug thriller? Like, which one are you talking about? <laughs> you yeah, know? name it. Name it, Rosenbaum. Ugh. Anyway, despite the Chicago Reader, uh, almost everyone liked it. It appeared on a number of critics' uh, year-end top 10 lists, including those of A.O. Scott, Roger Ebert, Owen Gleiberman of Entertainment Weekly, and Peter Travers for Rolling Stone. But Keir, uh, how about awards season? Well, Traffic had a long awards season. Listeners should check out the lengthy awards section on either IMDb or Wikipedia, which includes nearly two dozen Best Director nominations. But today, I want to talk about Soderbergh versus Soderbergh. Listeners of last week's episode will recall that Soderbergh's other 2000 film, Aaron Brockovich, was nominated for Best Picture and Best Director, with Julia Roberts nominated for Best Actress, Albert Finney nominated for Best Supporting Actor, and Susanna Grant nominated for Best Original Screenplay. Traffic also had five big Academy Award nominations, Best Picture and Best Director, with Benicio Del Toro nominated for Supporting Actor, Stephen Gagan, nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay, and Stefan Mirioni, I don't know if you say it with the Italian or not, nominated for Best Editing. It's almost like Soderbergh couldn't lose, except, as you said, he did lose Best Picture to Ridley Scott's Gladiator. Since last week's discussion, I've learned that Gladiator was the first movie to win Best Picture without also winning director or screenplay since All the King's Men in 1949. But Mike, are you not entertained? <laughs> are you not entertained? In the end, Traffic Soderbergh did beat Brockovich Soderbergh for director. Del Toro beat Finney for supporting actor. Gagan won for screenplay and Grant didn't, although they weren't competing head to head. And Mirioni won for editing. Traffic for Brockovich won. But Mike, what do you think? Taking all the other picks out of the picture, I want to know who you think should have won. So I, I want to imagine this as an Oscars contest only between Brockovich and Traffic. So it's, it's again, Soderbergh versus Soderbergh. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through this and I want your votes. So for best picture, who do you pick? Brockovich or Traffic? Brockovich. Okay. And then we'll do a lightning round you next. We'll go, we'll go one at a time. Sure. Through the, through, through the whole, so I'll do the list and you do the list. Okay. All right. So best picture, I got, I got Brockovich. Okay. Best director. Brockovich Soderbergh. Best. Okay. So I, I manipulated the categories here because for best actor, I really think it, you know, you would put Finney in for best actor, but since in real life, he was nominated uh, and won for supporting, or yeah. not one, but nominated for supporting. Right. I'm going to pencil in uh, Aaron Eckhart. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go Eckhart. Ooh, and I'm gonna change the course of film You're history because oh, wow. he becomes the leading man he ought to be, and uh, yeah, there's a whole new timeline. I'm really happy about Aaron Eckhart's new career. I think he, he deserves <laughs> greater things. I think he does too. Okay, so okay, so I, I'm not gonna call it a sweep yet, but so far it's uh, Rockvich is three for three. Okay, best supporting actor here. We're uh, once again we have Albert Finney versus Del Toro. Del Toro. Okay, so that's that's one for traffic. Best actress, Julia Roberts versus Catherine Zeta Jones. Oh, this this is a slam dunk. This is Julia Roberts. <laughs> yeah, that, I know that one's that one's easy. However, and this is this is again, it depends on who you nominate where. Yeah, I put uh, for best supporting actress, uh, I put Marg Helgenberger in for Aaron Brockovich because I think she did a really fine fine turn as as the sick resident of the, the small town there, versus Erica Christensen. Uh, I'm going Helgenberger. I thought she was great. She was really, really great. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Uh, best screenplay. Again, they're not really in the same category because one's original, one's adapted. But let's just 
face off Grant versus Gagan. I'm going Grant. I, I, that, wow. The tone of Aaron Brockovich, that's that's a hell of a thing that, that uh, she accomplished. Well, I, I, you're not wrong. Okay. Uh, best editing, Ann V. Coates versus Stefan Mirione. Uh, Stefan Mirione. Okay. So rare, a rare win for traffic. And best music, uh, Thomas Newman for Aaron Brockovich versus Cliff Martinez for traffic. Uh, Cliff Martinez. Okay, so a little throwing a little bone to traffic there. So a little I, bit, yeah. Let's see if I'm counting this correctly. We had five, six, seven, nine categories, and you picked uh, Brockovich for everything except. I think it's yeah, except for three. So so you have a. Uh, it's six to three for, for Brockovich. Yeah, pretty dominant okay. performance. Uh, all right, well, we, let's see where you land. Okay, and this is good because I actually haven't thought it through. So this is, this is on the fly. Yes, this is, the, this is the best way to do it. Best pitcher. Brockovich. Best director. Um, <laughs> that is so tough because, I, well, I think that, you know, it's sort of like what is the achievement? Because I think... Totally, like, Brockovich is just more of a, a satisfying single picture. But I almost think that what he accomplished was harder in traffic. So I'm going to give it to him for traffic. All right. Take, ah. go, with, go with your heart. Yeah. I just, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's more about the, the work than the, I don't know. Okay. Best actor. You know, it's funny because Douglas is really, Douglas does a great job for, for being a, an A-list movie star in traffic he does a great job of also being an ensemble player and it's a very it's a very subtle studied role it's a great point and i do love aaron eckhart but i think i'm gonna go oh i'm go, i'm gonna go i'm gonna go douglas okay oh wow um, i i really enjoy aaron eckhart a ton in that role and he's a lot of fun i think i think michael douglas had more work to do it's a great point. I just have a soft spark for Aaron Eckhart. Um, all right. Supporting actor. They're both brilliant, but I've got to go Del Toro on that. And it's it's almost like a coin toss because Albert Finney is so fucking good in Brockovich. He is, he he is. is just tremendous. Yeah. But Del Toro, I think, again, I would give it. I mean, and they're, they're both they're both subtle performances in, in some ways. But I think Del Toro's is more of an interior performance. And I think that's the hardest thing to do to convey. He's got a lot of, of bits where, you know, he's being talked to by General Salazar and he realizes he's in some very treacherous waters and he's got to agree with this guy while letting the audience know he's thinking something else. And he does it. Yeah. It's just genius. That's a great point. Genius stuff. Wow. You've watched this movie a lot, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> like I've spent so many hours of my life watching the movie Traffic. I'll be very happy to be done with this, this episode. <laughs> All right. Best actress. I'm also going to, I'm going to go Erica Christensen. I, no, no, no. That's supporting. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I jumped ahead. Um, best, best actress. Uh, yeah, Absolutely. No question, Julia Roberts. Okay. Uh, yeah. so now supporting. Yeah, I'm not right, crazy. Right. I'm not crazy. Uh, we, we, we already know best supporting is Erica Christensen. Uh, yeah, Erica Christensen. Um, I think Mark Helgenberger is a terrific actress, and I thought she was so good in Erica Brockovich. But I think Erica Christensen was almost an unknown. She'd done almost nothing, and she was a kid. I mean, she was a minor. Her mom was on the set during that horrific scene where she's – um, you know, being raped by her drug dealer, you know, and like the scene where she she takes a hit and like a tear rolls down her face, the scenes where she was had never done drugs and she had to portray being high. Um, I just think for a young actress, like mind blowing performance. So I'm going to give it to, to her, even though she does constantly make me think she's actually Julia Stiles. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking of Anakin Skywalker because that's just <laughs> <laughs> best screenplay uh best screenplay hmm, that's a tough one because like gagan had to do an insane amount of work to distill all of this stuff down so much research and it was clearly a struggle he also got some kind of help behind the scenes i'm gonna give it to grant hey oh there we go i'm gonna give it to grant because just as a writer myself, I feel like that is just a, like, that's a singular piece of storytelling that just absolutely holds together. And I think 
you know, no, no knock on Gagan. It was a, a terrific job. But that was also a movie that kind of had to be found in the in the shooting and editing. I agree. And I think Grant had a tough job, too. I mean, that's that's a that's a biopic of somebody's yep. life, plus the courtroom stuff like that's uh, that's a tough job. And how do you explain like, right, like like humanizing this we this a chemical poisoning? Yes. You know, it's where the crime, you don't even see it. Right. I mean, because it's in the water. Um, and yeah, so I, I think, yes, yeah, terrific job by her. All right. We're almost there. Best editing. Yeah, I'm going to go. I'm going to give it to Traffic. Coates was terrific, and it's a really well-edited film. Again, I just think, like, I think it's a harder job um, to, to edit Traffic, I think, Mariana. And, and to, to make that movie mostly comprehensible. There's still, like, one or two moments where you're scratching your head, but it's pretty remarkable. All right, we have this. So this is the last one, and this is, this is going to be a very, and I'm not going to tell you right now, but it's going to be a very important vote for you right now, Kier best music oh my gosh Rokovich. whoa okay so it was previously to that um was five to three i'm sorry yeah five to three in favor of traffic and if you voted for martinez you would have been six to three in favor of traffic so we would have been exact opposites but instead it lands five to four honey traffic funny. still ahead though yeah i think it's almost because like i can't even like uh, you know Cliff Martinez is a great, versatile composer, but it just wasn't as much part of the film experience for me, uh, the score in Traffic. It's funny that I, I ended up coming out so heavily Traffic because just as a film watching experience, I just enjoy Brockovich more. There's no question. It's yeah. a very entertaining and I like film. Police Academy more than a lot of things. It doesn't mean... <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just that when I think about the, the challenges and the professional difficulties that these people had to overcome, and if that's what I'm awarding, that's the way I'd vote. Oh, yeah. But I'd still I, rather watch Brockovich. Yeah, I'm with you, 100%. Yeah, although I did go with Brockovich anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was fun, though. And I, you know, I dream of a year in which Soderbergh has five nominated movies in a single category, so there's no way he can lose. Hey, that's that year's not far off. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> okay, what kind of traffic did traffic do at the box office? Uh, I, too, traffic in dad jokes, Mike. Oh, ow. And <laughs> even with Hollywood math, it was profitable. So at a budget of $48 million, even with reshoots, according to Soderbergh, he brought it in $2 million under budget. So even with Hollywood math, it made money. U.S. box office of $124 million. Worldwide, it, it went uh, over $200 million, up to $207 million, still climbing probably. Soderbergh told one interviewer, that Brockovich, quote, turned out to be the film that paid back Universal for my other three movies that didn't make their money. So with Traffic, Soderbergh is firmly in the black. And with his next movie, he's about to hit the jackpot. And your films are different from each other. Aaron Brockovich is a very different film than this. Yeah, I think so. Um, very different in its intent. You know, they share a certain social consciousness, but um, beyond that, one of the appeals of traffic was um, that it was, uh, a, it was a more ambitious, larger, edgier movie. And, um, you know, the next one won't be. We know where Soderbergh is in his career. King of the Hill, baby. But let's take a few minutes to talk about how his craft is developing. I always like this part where we kind of like, just kind of track his, his development as an artist a little bit and, and his signature moves and, and where things are going. Um, so I think at this point, he's clearly decided he's more interested in other people's stories than his own. Yeah, I would agree. And I like this part too. I, I was gonna agree, absolutely. Um, I actually just had a thought right now. That made me think about what we were thinking about with um, his contributions to the script with Gagan, right? Mm -hmm. I wonder also if he's now become um, more confident with, um, how do I say this? Like being, I don't want to say in control of the script because I don't think he's that person. I mm -hmm. think he's a very good collaborator. But I think that we had discussions before with uh, King of the Hill and mm -hmm. Kafka especially where he had... Um, Gosh, tell me who, who wrote King of the Hill, the memoir. 
Oh, A.E. Hotchner. Hotchner. Okay. And then Dobbs, who's a screenwriter of, uh, of not just the Limey, but of Kafka. Mm -hmm. He had these two guys on set. And we talked about how they were like influential figures on yeah. the movie that may have sort of not handicapped Soderbergh, but maybe influenced him a little bit. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing like the that go the other way. Like he influenced Gagan and he helped Gagan. He got his yeah. hands in that clay a little bit. Whereas before it felt like he was the clay that was getting somebody else's hands into him. Mike, that's the kind of insight I've come to expect from you. And once again, you deliver. <laughs> we should do a podcast. We should do a podcast. <laughs> I think we've got something to say. <laughs> we've talked about, hey, he's realized he's not the writer. He doesn't really have that much to say. But yeah, this it's no coincidence that in this same year, he's done two social issue movies. So not only is he not really interested in gazing at his own navel and thinking about like, what kind of person am I or what, how am I in relationships? He's really looking outward and he's looking at stories that matter to other people. And he's talking looking at social issues and he's thinking about the world and, and you know, he's thinking about justice. Yeah. And I'm glad you bring that up because I often forget that Aaron Brockovich is a social issue film and you're right. It very much is, you know, like you said, I mean, it's about water poisoning and it's, you know, there, there is some really, I mean, it's become where it's funny where traffic has maybe become less salient. That's probably become more salient and it's, you know, in terms of like, us digging into the earth and what are we doing and why and what are its effects so yeah i mean he he is doing that I and mean, it's a really good point like he is not just looking outward but pretty broadly outward and to to magnificent results absolutely um in terms of like his this kind of role on the set you know he's transitioned from directing and editing which is more of a post-production role to shooting and directing so it's more kind of production I mean, he obviously, no matter what, he's always been, you know, a pre-production guy who plans things out and very methodical. But so he's he's much more kind of in the moment and getting the the thing that he needs in the moment. And he, he this is the film where he became a card carrying cinematographer, um, but the WGA wouldn't let him have a directed and photographed by credit, unfortunately, uh, because the photography credit can't go between the writing and directing credits. Um, so he ends up having the photography credited to his pseudonym, Peter Andrews. Yes. But I love the fact that he doesn't like take a possessory credit and he doesn't want to have like multiple credits because he feels like it's pretentious. So if he has to take a second title card, he just uses a pseudonym and good for him. One of the things that was really interesting that, um, uh, I came across late, late last night, propping my eyes open with toothpicks, listening to that <laughs> producer commentary is Laura Bickford says, uh, she said something really interesting. And she said that one of the reasons traffic has manages to be a unified film, despite the fact that many of these actors never worked with each other or encountered each other in any way, because people from one storyline would come to one town, they'd shoot that stuff, and then they'd go off and make their next movie and Soderbergh and, and crew move on, work with a new set and a new location. She said that Soderbergh was the unifying person and not just in that he was the director, but because he's operating the camera and he uses lenses that often place him very much in direct proximity to the, to the actors. He's right there in their faces that, that even though he doesn't coach and direct the actors too much, he is there with them and his presence somehow, you know, she, I think she used the word osmosis, kind of has some sort of effect of kind of like binding things together, creating a tone that kind of evens it out and makes things consistent for everybody. And I thought that was such a fascinating influence that that kind of rings true. He's the, he's the unifying element and he's right there. He's not standing back behind, you know, a, a rack of video monitors while other people are, you know, he's not 30 or 40 feet away from the actors. He is right there with them. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great nugget that you came across because it, it's something I would have never thought of, you know, like that these, you know, big name actors that he uh, has in this movie never cross paths, yet it's still a very totally consistent movie, as you said. And um, if you're looking for the one thing that unifies all of it, it's it's Soderbergh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Douglas and Del Toro are never, you know, in frame together, but they feel like they're in the same movie. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so we've talked already about, you know, how it's lean and mean. You know, he made it with a, for that budget. It was a small crew, two handheld cameras, you know, running simultaneously using available light. You know, it was, I don't remember exactly in what movie he referenced this, but 
Soderbergh did tell somebody at some point that he had felt like formalism was a dead end, you know, that he had really, you know, I think anybody, a director who starts out as a student of film, kind of, you, you shoot what you know, you, uh, you kind of start out imitating what you know. And you, certainly there's an element of formalism to his earlier films. I mean, you look at something like Kafka, like he's very consciously um, channeling, you know, German expressionism and, and some other things like that. Um, and here it's like, he's finally just like, no, that's not it. That's not me. That's not what I want to do. It's all about the process. He, he's spoken about how he loves most making films, not editing or watching them or whatever. He likes the process of making them. So he's developed his filmmaking style around the making of films and being in the moment and being present and wow. You know, so then he makes an Oscar winning movie that, you know, makes a ton of money. Yeah. Well, I think you can, I, I wonder what your thoughts about this because as a fellow artist, part of art is it's so part of your identity, you know, and to, to Soderbergh's point about like uh, he loves making the movie, the, 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 the actual process of making the movie, because I would say like I'm trying to say this in the best way possible. That's who you are at that moment, you know, like finding the movie, finding the book, finding the story, whatever is is tied to your identity that's who you are at that moment you get so deep into your work like do you think there's part of that for Soderbergh as well it's like it's a it's almost like becomes that's his identity right now that is who mm. he is the guy who's making this movie and then he's in a way somebody else when he's making the next movie I do you feel that way when you write these books it totally depends on the project I mean partly because I've never really written that deeply personal novel well Soderbergh I mean eh, Soderbergh's made so couple of personal films. I don't think, I haven't felt that way yet, per se. I mean, I think, I do associate different books with different periods in my life and kind of who I was then. But I think it's kind of almost the reverse of what you're describing for me. But I, I think it's a really interesting point about Soderbergh. And I also think that, you know, people talk about actors a lot. I mean, actors are people who somehow find themselves in the characters they play. I mean, the, yeah. great, the great actors are... And um, they, I think, really have to be in the moment. And some, you know, we've all heard the stories about the annoying actors who are too mad yeah. or too wrapped up, you know, and I don't think Soderbergh goes quite that far, but I, I think there's really an, a grain of truth in what you're saying in that, like, I think he's happiest behind a camera filming a movie and that's how he finds himself. Exactly. Yeah. I think you said it much better than I did. Like, cause that's, he's finding himself, like he wasn't finding himself in Kafka because he was trying to be somebody else. Yeah. You yeah. know, like, and then he finally let go of the formalism. Like I'm going to go, that's not me. I can't do it this way. I can't do it. Like, like this formalistic style, whatever it may be. And I'm just going to let myself be free to do whatever. And he finds himself in the freedom. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's such fascinating stuff to think about. And he's clearly he, he just starts to seem happier around this period of his, his life, too. Yeah. And the movies become more fun to watch. They do. In general. Traffic, exception. But in general, they become much more fun to watch. Huh. He, he Obviously, this is kind of like a quasi-documentary style, partly because of the, the style in which he shot it. But he chose to really lean into the run-and-gun style because he was thinking about movies like Battle of Algiers and Z. Um, you know, he, there, he told uh, Anthony Kaufman... Quote, for this film, I spent a lot of time analyzing Battle of Algiers and Z, both of which have that great feeling of things that are caught instead of staged, which is what we were after. I just wanted that sensation of chasing the story, the sense that it may outrun us if we don't move quickly enough. And I just wanted to share that quote because I just think that's so great, like caught instead of staged. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really cool. You know, he's really, we talked so much about his versatility, um, you know, but he's, he's really the indie studio guy now. Like he is comfortable making movies either way. Mm -hmm. uh, he can make a, a well-financed indie that feels like a studio film, or he can go ahead and make a studio film now and, and feel comfortable in that. Kaufman uh, said back to him, he said, now people are comparing you to directors like John Ford and Howard Hawks. You're making movies really quickly. You're making them within the studio system and you're making them in your own way. What's your reaction to that? And Soderbergh said, that's sort of the way the business has worked out. It's not surprising when you consider the independent movement or whatever you want to call it has been swallowed up by the studios. So it seems inevitable that I'd be some sort of hybrid. 
But you also have to, at some point, acknowledge what your capabilities are and your limitations are. And if I turn out to be somebody who's better suited to making the kinds of films I've been making lately than art house movies, then whatever. If you can't hit the three-point shot, you should stop shooting three-point shots and learn how to drive the lane. So I'm just trying to play to my strengths. That doesn't mean I'm not going to make stuff like The Limey or Son of Schizopolis. It just means I'm playing to my strengths. Huh. I mean, talk about wisdom, you know, like, and just, you've said it a number of times and you're so right, just the level of self-awareness that he has and the, not only the self-awareness, but the comfort with his own self-awareness. And he's just, he just has it down. I can't believe like we've, um, and all the people we've compared him to, you know, George, George Stevens, Michael Curtis, you know, et cetera, uh, that Hawks and Ford haven't come up, especially Hawks, who is a remarkably versatile director, who's also fast, who's also working with often, you know, the same cast. And, you know, there's so many parallels between the two of them. And it just makes sense that he would be compared to them. And, and, and he has it right. They were just kind of like their strengths lie for two, but probably more Hawks, I would argue, in being business minded, I guess you can say like, yeah, well, you know what, here's where the industry is going and here's where the business is going and here's the opportunities that are going to be afforded to me. So I'm going to learn how to go and do these things. Like I can't survive by making um, the underneath and making th these type of movies. So I had to learn, as he says, to drive the lane or how whatever sports metaphor you want to use, <laughs> you know, and, and that's something only the really best do. You know, we grew up, I, at least I grew up in Chicago, and I remember the time when Michael Jordan started shooting from three points more often and shooting these perimeter shots, like, because he lost a step, you know? And he's like, I gotta start doing something else. And it's the best that really have that self-awareness and are able to teach the, teach the old dog new tricks. And he's constantly, constantly teaching himself new tricks. And I love that you brought the basketball metaphor back. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I always got a good Michael Jordan story. <laughs> well, this was a long episode, but Traffic is one hell of a long movie. Uh, it's his longest movie until Che, and it's still his second longest, whether you count Che as one or two movies. So there's bound to be a lot to talk about. We really hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Filmographers Podcast. If you have, we beg you, please subscribe and take a moment to give us a good rating or a review on your platform of choice. Even better, tell a film-loving friend to join us on our journey to watch all the films of Steven Soderbergh. You can follow us on Instagram at The Filmographers, or on X at Filmographer Pod, or on Letterboxd at Filmographers. Special thanks to Kevin Lau, our producer, Gompson, who composed and played our theme music, and Cosmo Graf, who designed our logo. If you have feedback, suggestions, or just want to share a fun Soderbergh fact, email us at the Filmographers Podcast at gmail.com. Join us next week on the Filmographers Podcast when we'll discuss Soderbergh's next money losing, audience alienating, self indulgent independent film. Yes, Ocean's Eleven, right here? <laughs> Join us next week on the Filmographers Podcast when we'll discuss Soderbergh's next star-studded, big-budget, crowd-pleasing box office success. Mm -hmm.